Welcome to the Voices in Leadership series, which focuses on science and leadership. I am Betty Johnson, and I have the privilege to direct this program and introduce today's guest. Gina McCarthy is an environmental health and air quality expert who is a thought leader and advocate for common sense strategies to protect public health and the environment. Appointed by President Obama in 2009 as Assistant Administrator for the Environmental Protection Agency, Office of Air and Radiation, she was named EAP Administrator in 2013. A longtime public servant, she has advised five Massachusetts governors on environmental affairs. She previously served as Commissioner of the Connecticut Department of Environmental Protection, Deputy Secretary of the Massachusetts Office of Commonwealth Development, and Undersecretary for Policy for the Massachusetts Executive Office of Environmental Affairs. Of her many contributions, Ms. McCarthy considers the start of the Regional Greenhouse Gas Initiative, the first cap and trade program for greenhouse gas emissions in the U.S. to be one of her major environmental achievements. A native of Boston, Ms. McCarthy graduated from the University of Massachusetts Boston with a Bachelor of Arts in Social Anthropology. She also earned a Master of Science in Environmental Health Engineering and Planning and Policy from Tufts University. She is currently a Mitchell Senior Leadership Fellow and is teaching a course in the Harvard Chan School's Department of Environmental Health. She is also an Institute of Politics Fellow at the Harvard Kennedy School. It's been a joy to have her in our Senior Fellows Office Suite. With my Texas inflection and the Kentucky twain of Governor Steve Brashear, <laughs> who is also a senior fellow, it's been a bit of a friendly competition to see who has the best regional accent. <laughs> and she certainly has done Boston proud. <laughs> Before I turn this session over to today's interviewer, Dr. Howard Cole, Harvey V. Feinberg, Professor of the Practice of Public Health Leadership, Please join me as we welcome Ms. Gina McCarthy to the Voices in Leadership series at the Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health. So Gina, welcome back. Thank you. Thanks, Howard. Thank you, Betty. Great introduction. In my <laughs> accent's way better than either of you. <laughs> so a year ago, I had the pleasure of interviewing you in the studio. At the time, you were the EPA Administrator for the United right. States. Today, you are out of government after 35 years I'm of public... out of a job. <laughs> Thank you for giving me a job here. That was really nice of you. We're enjoying having you as a fellow at our school. Me too. But we have a new administration in that has vastly different priorities about the environment. And so, as you're viewing the developments that seem to be coming almost daily, tell, tell us your feelings, your thoughts on this, and how do we keep this all in perspective as we move forward? Well, I think we made some significant leaps and bounds over the past eight years in the Obama administration, you know, on climate change in particular, but also on clean air and clean water. And obviously, those are important uh, commitments to keep to the American public. That's why EPA is around. We're essentially a public health agency. That's what we do for a living. And so I'm, I'm understandably upset about the idea that EPA's role could be so significantly diminished and that there is continued talk and commitment to roll back some of the ver progress we made um, towards clean air and clean water as well as climate change. Uh, but, you know, people do have to keep this in perspective because people come up to me now and they start going, oh, Gina, how are you? You know, I'm like, did somebody die? You know, these are not personal issues for me. And people need to understand that while there's a lot of promises to roll things back, it takes a very long time for government to change its direction. And we worked really hard to develop and take actions that were really based on science, real fact had robust documentation. They were within the law in exactly the authorities that Congress gave us. And we did it in a transparent way. And I'm very confident that those will stand the test of time. And I'm confident that this administration is severely underestimating their ability to roll back really sound actions that are taken at the federal level. 
So I want people to take a little bit of a deep breath while you have concerns. You know, there is a, a lot of work between here and rolling something back, and, and we just have to be active citizens again. We have to make clean air and clean water a known priority and, and speak our mind about what the core values of this country are and what we want in terms of U.S. leadership moving forward. Let's talk more about science. This past weekend was the March for Science in some 500 cities across the world. You, you were a speaker at one of the marches. I was. What's your message today for scientists and what's their role in uh, the current climate? Well, it's, it's a confusing place for scientists. I think one, one, uh, one that's making scientists feel a little bit un uncomfortable. And one of the reasons why I'm so excited to be here is that it gives me exposure to all of the young scientists of tomorrow. It's just quite an amazing thing. If there's anything that can balance out what you hear in Washington these days, it's looking at their faces and realizing that the next generation is hopefully uh, going to keep moving forward and making the kind of directional changes that we need following this administration. Um, they're so committed, so young, so bright. It's pretty awesome. It makes me feel so old every day. Um, but, you know, I think what I try to tell them is there's a couple of really important things that they need to consider. One is that they need to communicate clearly. The words of science don't translate to the normal human beings who aren't in the business of science. When they see things like it's very likely, a normal person reads that as you don't know what you're talking about. It's a toss of the coin. You know, when you, and then when you end by saying science is evolving, this is when I go, I don't say science is evolving, because <laughs> what it means is you hardly know what you're talking about now, and that may be you know nothing later. You know, you need to speak in language that people understand so they take it seriously. And, and not, you know, not with less definition, but just using the, the language that people can embrace. Because it's important for us to understand where science is heading. The, the other thing I tell them is that, unfortunately, science is getting caught up now in this partisanship in a way that it wasn't before. And it's being fundamentally attacked. Um, and as much as nobody wants scientists to get political or politics to touch the science, right now the scientists are perhaps the only ones that can stand up and speak to these issues with the clarity and with the authority that we need right now. And so we have bills on the Hill that are looking to fundamentally take away EPA's ability to, to um, uh, consider in making fundamental health decisions about air quality and other things that fundamentally consider the best studies we have available from such nefarious places as the Harvard School of Public Health um, and the American Cancer Society. And we just can't let those studies go to waste. They are fundamental to our understanding and our rulemaking. Um, and they're also trying to change our peer review process. But most importantly, they're just questioning the ability of science as a whole to be invested in and its necessity and what it's brought to our country and what it needs to continue to bring in terms of advancing our health and well-being. It's unbelievable the kind of science investments that they're looking to disinvest in wholeheartedly. It doesn't make any sense. One major development of your time in office was, of course, the 2015 Paris Climate Agreements, yeah. which was a... I put on a lot of mileage in that convention yeah, We want to hear more about that. And, uh, that involved some 195 countries yeah, that signed and many of them ratified this, this treaty, which is now in force. And now in the era of the new administration, lots of questions about what's going to happen with that. Can yeah. you tell us more about your thoughts on that? Well, you know, I have been going to conferences of the parties um, related to these climate discussions for so long. And I'll tell you, Paris had an entirely different complexion about it. And it's uh, and what we came out with in Paris was an incredible agreement. Um, it was strong. It produced accountability. Um, it would follow the science. It would have the countries working together. It would support every country, including developing countries who were looking to identify a path forward for themselves to bring their population out of poverty while doing it 
in a way that would be consistent with a low carbon future. And that was a result of a couple of things, Howard. One was amazingly is that we have solutions now to really start forcing carbon out of our future. We have renewable energy and energy efficiency that's knocking the socks off of fossil energy here in the United States and elsewhere. So we have things we can do now. So you can make those commitments. And it was apparent that people felt like it was no longer trying to admit to a really bad problem where we didn't have any answers. We have some. So the flavor, the tone was fine. Plus, I have to tout President Obama and his leadership even before going into Paris. One of the reasons why President Obama really committed across the United States to take climate action, and in particular at EPA, was to show our strong domestic commitment. It was to get things done here that would give us the creds, even before Paris, to work with China so that he could work with his counterpart and, and set a fertile ground for really good work to be done. And he did that. We did not go in there as we had in the past, hoping for the best. We came in there with a plan, and that plan was quite remarkable. And for the first time now, you have an international agreement that's solid, that's foundational, that can allow countries to work together. And honestly, the, the, uh, the excitement leaving there I was on a plane, unintentionally. Everybody ended up on the same plane. I don't know if there was only one plane for everybody to be on. <laughs> they probably said, all the stupid U US people have to go on this plane. Everybody else goes somewhere else. But, but we were on this plane. I'm telling you, we were flying 1,500 miles above wherever that plane was. <laughs> it was just exciting. And so it, it set the stage for, for innovation and investment to follow. One of the things we recognize is that we know we can make progress and we're going to lock that in. But it also said we have a lot of work to do. And if we don't start now to send the right signal internationally on what we value internationally, what we have to do to keep this planet safe for our kids' future, then we're making a mistake because we're not going to drive investment that we need in innovation. And that was the big promise of both the actions we took in the U.S. and internationally was that today we would tell people what we wanted the future to look like. How we could get there would be up to the private sector, innovators like in this university and others that had the best and brightest ideas because they take time to mature. And those ideas would be the next bunch of solutions so we could get the next tranche of reductions instead of holding off denying climate science because they don't know all the answers. Mm -hmm. And so it was exciting and it is, it is fundamental that the U.S. continue to provide leadership there, both by staying in the Paris Agreement and by meeting our commitments, but also by taking advantage of the economic opportunities that leadership provides. That's what we do for a living in the United States. Mm -hmm. What the heck's the matter with everybody? <laughs> Why would we want to run away and cede our leadership to China? So tell <laughs> us more about the private sector role and the leadership of yeah. the future of energy, where the trends are going. Well, let me talk about a, a couple of leadership, Howard. Thank you for, for raising it. Business is really important right now. Uh, just not more than uh, not, uh, maybe a month or so ago, there were 750 or so companies, really large companies, who wrote to the president and said, stick in the Paris Agreement because it's important to us. They see the need for a low carbon future. They understand the economic risks that their companies are in, and they see the economic benefits of making this shift. And so they're stepping up big time. Fortune 500 companies are all looking at their own greenhouse gas footprint. They're all, all pricing carbon when they're making decisions about what services to provide, how to provide them, what kind of products to produce, how to manage their own facilities, how to manage their operations. It's a big deal. They're accounting for it. And they don't expect that they'll have a federal government that's going to be sitting in the wings waiting to see what happens or actively working against what the future needs to look like. And so they're, they're, they're big time. But the other leadership is states and federal and, and uh, cities. Because I know everybody's worried that if the, if the U.S. doesn't continue to lead, which it doesn't seem to be at the moment, clearly, will anything happen? You know, 
I work for, for state government, sorry about that, uh, for, um, I don't know, 25 years or more. And I'll tell you, whenever the federal government wanted to sit and take a break, the, the states and the cities and the towns, they stepped up because they don't let that happen. They'll fill that void every time. That's what the Regional Greenhouse Gas Initiative was. If, if the um, President Bush didn't feel like moving forward, then they, we could do it, and we did. Yeah, tell us more about Reggie, the regional great house Reggie gas. Reggie was a blast. <laughs> uh, Reggie was a blast because it get out, got all the frustrations of not having federal action, and it actually allowed <laughs> all the great people at EPA, 15,000 great people at EPA, to actually use all of their technical skills to help us do something that wasn't happening at the and federal level. What was your role at the time? I, I began this discussion when I was uh, working in Massachusetts in the environmental agency. And, and it actually passed when I was in Connecticut as the commission of the Department of Environmental Protection. It was a, a plan by the New England states, a um, couple of the mid-Atlantic, New York, New Jersey. Um, we all got together and decided that we would test out a cap and trade program that looked at um, our utilities in, in our various states and set caps for them to uh, achieve certain levels of carbon pollution. What, years, what oh, year was that? Oh my lord, I knew you were going to ask me that, and I have absolutely no idea. The discussions began in, um, oh, I don't know, 20, 2002, 2003, and I think it was culminated in 2006. And what we decided to do was you basically auction allowances off and the companies compete, and the revenues would actually go to help them, but also we kept some of the, the proceeds ourselves and invested in energy efficiency to keep demand growth down. And it's been a great opportunity for both the utilities who have not strained to do their jobs, um, but it has helped to switch our, our systems and to make it clear that clean energy is where to go if you want to live in, in these areas. It has allowed us to grow jobs in solar and wind, benefited from those energy efficiencies to keep costs low, keep a reliable and safe energy system, and it tested out real well. And as a result of that, there was every hope in the first part of the Obama administration that would get a national cap and trade program. but. That failed by a couple of votes in the Senate side. But it's, if really, if the federal government doesn't want to lead, it certainly does not mean that the United States or America won't lead. Are there other parts of the country that might follow these themes, like Reggie has? Well, I've heard that California does okay. Uh, I know. <laughs> Just kidding, friends from California. Uh, they, they actually developed uh, for California a um, a, a multi-sector approach to doing exactly the same thing, which was t setting goals on different industry sectors. And it's a, um, a law that we affectionately refer to as AB 32. Um, and it's great, been a great mechanism to help achieve reductions um, in, uh, in California in terms of greenhouse gases they're, that they're emitting. But it's also been a great... Um, uh, basically uh, effort on their part to also coordinate it with other absolutely critical environmental goals be that are consistent and related to climate change, which is things like clean air. You know, it allows you to get co-benefits from reductions of greenhouse gases and get those other pollutants out of the system. And it's helped them to begin to figure out how to tackle some of the water problems that they face during the drought and how you begin to look more systemically at the challenge of climate change and use proceeds from that type of a process to actually support adaptation efforts and equity issues associated with climate, which are, which are really important. So it's been great. So California's been great. Having said that, there's a lot of other activities that have gone on across the states. There's work in the Midwest. There's work in the Western states. A lot of that work was done as we were designing the, the, carb, the clean power plant which is now being relooked at by this administration. The Clean Power Plan was an effort to, to just uh, allow states flexibility to find ways to achieve reductions to meet goals in, in, the, the, uh, in carbon reduction from the utility sector. And those states began to explore partnerships with one another. A lot of that efforts have abated, some of it hasn't because the states know that this is a blip on the radar screen and they have to head there and collaborating together would be the best thing to do. 
And, and under the radar screen, there's this interesting thing happening. It's called governors, whether they're red or blue, being fiscally responsible <laughs> and making good financial decisions. Um, it's called buying renewable energy and investing in energy efficiency because, you know, it's just not all about the rules. It's about what makes sense to do. And because we've done so well to lower the cost of renewable energy that it's so competitive that you're finding that the, the highest percentage of renewable energy of any state is in Ohio. Go hang out in Texas and see if you can turn your head without looking at a wind turbine. You know, so it doesn't matter if you're red or blue, you go where you, it's best for your consumers. And right now, the clean energy train in this country has left the station and it's not going back. And so this, this administration should be embracing that train. It should be in the, you know, in the engine, not the caboose, you know, making sure that we lead this because it's happening all over the world. And it's, it's fun to watch, but it's depressing to see that we might see that leadership. So you're a person who's worked for both Republican and Democratic leaders. Yeah. You view this as a bipartisan issue. You've just mentioned some of the themes that could appeal to leaders of any yeah. political stripe. Yeah. What other comments you want to make on how to make this a bipartisan issue going forward? Well, you know, I kind of try to remind everybody that environmental protection for, for decades has been a bipartisan issue. It just happened to start with Teddy Roosevelt, you know, I mean, when he did a lot of his conservation work and created the national parks. But e even more recently, Richard Nixon started the EPA. You know, it's one of the things I like about him. That's one. Uh, sorry. <laughs> And then you have, um, you know, you have uh, George H.W. Bush came in after the Reagan years when Reagan was really looking at rolling back a lot of protections and, and relying more on businesses to do the right thing. And that didn't turn out well for him. The American public spoke pretty loudly that they, they would really prefer to have clean air and, and clean water the way that they've designed it. And, and, and as a result, George H.W. Bush came in and he showed their, the Republican strength on this issue and he pushed forward the Clean Air Act Amendment of 1990, which is perhaps the best public health law. I know I, I stretch when I say it in a school of public health uh, in, in the world. Uh, it has saved so many lives. Um, and it's, uh, so it's been remarkable. It is a bipartisan issue. But of, of late, particularly around, I think, the issue of climate change, it's gotten very polarized. And, it, and, and I think the best we can hope for is to have intelligent conversations that respect the science, that begin to get beyond this climate is a religious issue or a liberal hoax, and really look at the information. When scientists do, it, it's clear. And if they can help speak to to individuals to get them to get uh, stop looking at sound bites and start really getting concerned about an issue that really threatens not just our current public health but the future of the planet. It's kind of a big risk uh, to to sit and not take action. But uh, beyond that, I'll, I'll be darned if I know how to what the magic bullet mm -hmm. is to bring it back together again. I'd like to think I did. But in my opinion, it's a lot of grassroots discussion. It's a lot of individuals talking to their family, if you can tolerate it. <laughs> I do once in a while. You know, talk to your friends and neighbors. Get climate to stop being some kind of a political issue and more of an everyday conversation because we're seeing climate impacts every day. Just call it out. Let's just get over it and start figuring out how we take advantage of the economic opportunities that that embracing the climate challenge can have for us. So now you're in this extraordinary situation to look back over 35 years in public service and think about leadership. What, what lessons do you focus on that you convey to the students while you're teaching here? Well, I, you know, I, I think I, I like to tell them that just because things are technical that we work on, in bureaucracies use all kinds of acronyms that I can never remember. You know, it's just important to remember who you work for <laughs> and how to talk to them. I think part of the problem we've had is there's been too many politicians talking to one another and the rest of us listening in. 
And that's not how it can be. You've got to communicate with people. You have to be the strongest communicator you can. Be honest with people. I always tell them to seek out diverse opinions. Anybody who surrounds themselves by people like them are making the most serious mistake. Because in this country, we represent everybody's interests. And, and that's what you have to have at the table, not you, mini me's telling you how wonderful you're doing, you know? And so I, I think that's important. And the last thing I try to tell them is that when you're thinking about what you're going to do, and if you want to, you know, you want to make a difference with your life, go where your strengths are, know what your capabilities are, and, and get a job that tests those capabilities, that asks you to do a little bit more than you ever thought you could. Or maybe like me, you didn't have any idea what the job was, but you took it anyways and it worked out. <laughs> you know, stretch yourself, take risks, um, because it, what, it's what makes life so interesting. You know, you're always living on the edges. Oh, God, can I really do this? Versus, you know, this is just eye-opening when you see things you've never seen before and you take on jobs that you've never thought about having. So, Gina, thank you so much for your service. It's great to have you at the school. Uh, and we are delighted to have you here, the studio audience, and we want to remind you that the next Voices in Leadership series is May 9th when former FDA Commissioner Dr. Margaret Hamburg comes to visit. Round of applause for Gina McCarthy. Thank you, Howard. If you are interested in supporting this program and others like this from the Leadership Studio at the Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health, please call 617-432-1318 for further information.